Well, hey guys, and welcome to Drive to Win, presented by the Win Las Vegas and brought to you by Mobile One for the love of driving. I'm Justin Bell. And I'm your host here on this podcast, and we've been having such a great year, but every time I feel I'm a little bit on a treadmill, that hamster wheel of kind of saying the same thing at the top of the show, which would be, of course, that Max Verstappen has just won the Grand Prix. But this week, I don't mean to sound joyous about it, but like every other motorsport commentator, pundit, fan, and team and driver, I am pleased to say that this past weekend in Singapore did bring an entirely different landscape to Formula One. And it is not, it's not that I'm reveling in the fact that Max Verstappen and his Red Bull did not win, but it's more the fact that it opened us up for one of the best races, certainly the last third of it, that we've had all season. And it just showed that, you know, we've said it, other people have said it. I wonder what this race would be like without Max. Uh, dominating? Well, we sure found out, didn't we? It was an incredible weekend in Singapore, and I can't wait to dive into it. My guest this week is Derek Hill. He is son of the legendary Formula One Ferrari driver, Phil Hill. He went, he was Ferrari's, uh, the, America's first world champion. I mean, truly one of the titans of our sport, and I'll explain a bit more in a minute, but Derek has followed in his footsteps very eloquently and with grace and style, and uh, he is almost a token Italian because of their connection to Ferrari. So I can't wait to, to jump in there. But what a weekend. I was glued to it from the minute I saw on my phone, oh, wow, the, the free practice one times. Ooh, gosh, science is on front. And I thought to myself, this is going to be a weekend. Where are the Red Bulls? Max complaining about problems with his car, with his upshifts and downshifts. And Sergio talking about problems with, you know, his his overall handling. And I'm thinking, this is setting up. There's a there's a little trouble in the camp. So anyway, I was I was very excited. It's it's a tr crazy weekend on the drivers. It's hot, humid, and very physically demanding. It's a two-hour race, pretty much. And the track, 19 turns, brings everything together in a in a very unconventional way. And as you can see, it's it suits some teams and doesn't suit the others. And certainly this week, it did not suit the Red Bull. It really gave us, as I said, an indication of what Formula One would be like if we didn't have Red Bull in the running. And those other teams, it isn't necessarily a natural order to things if you go from for the best of the rest, because now those rests are really brought themselves up to an elevated level of performance for so many reasons. Um, and of course, Singapore is a circuit that has not brought good fortune to Red Bull in the past. Max has never actually won there. So if there was going to be a venue to end the freight train of success that has been Red Bull and Max Verstappen, it would be this past weekend. And it surely played out like that. So how did it all come about? It was really the tale of qualifying that set the scene. Uh, I mean, Red Bull weren't looking good all weekend, and there were, there were complaints coming from their camp, which was totally independent of the progress that Ferrari, McLaren, and Mercedes had made. I mean, Ferrari were fast in every session. Sainz was leading his teammate, uh, very, you know, Charles Leclerc, very handily most of the weekend, and, well, actually, all of the weekend, and we've seen that shift, haven't we? And we talked about it a bit last week on last week's show, that we've seen a dynamic shift in the role of number one inside Ferrari from Leclerc to Sainz based purely on performance. And I would argue, rather like we talked about with Will, Will Buxton, there is a strength to Carlos that is now starting to assert himself. He really did come back from the summer break, I don't know, as though he was a man reborn. It's not like he wasn't showing the promise before, but he is uncompromising and unfiltered in his in his pursuit of, of winning Formula One races now. And it's a joy to joy to watch. We'll get in a little bit later about how that unfolded in the race. But of course, the big thing was coming off qualifying, could they capitalize on just the momentum from Italy? from going to, um, you know, over the last few races into this one. Could they do that? And as we know, Ferrari have a habit of being able to step on their own appendage anytime they want. 
and take away the wins from the drivers. So that was for me what I was I was couldn't wait to see at the green flag. Another interesting dynamic uh, was the George Russell against Lewis Hamilton. I mean, we know Lewis is one of the finest drivers ever to get behind the wheel. And George is the up and comer who has firmly established himself as equal in pace to Lewis, but dealing with a lot less experience. He ran the Mercedes pace all weekend. And you could see that that really did result in him having, you know, a very strong uh, resulting qualifying second on the grid lining up on the front row. So when we saw the, the qualifying laid out with Carlos Sainz in pole, Russell, Leclerc, Norris, Hamilton, and then, of course, we, we saw moving down, um, you had uh, Fernando Alonso who was in seventh, and then an amazing qualifying by Liam Lawson to be in tenth. But absence, notably absent, of course, were Red Bull. They did not make qualifying three. So it was outstanding. I don't know the last time they did that, but you could tell that was really setting the scene for something special as the race came around. Now, of course, when you look at how storylines can unfold in a race, you have to look at what they've done in the past and how they run on race pace. And that is where, without doubt, the Red Bulls with um, you know Perez and Verstappen have been extraordinary. And it's not just Max's ability to extract the most in every circumstance. But we've seen him start a bit further back and just trump his way to the front, haven't we? And eventually, a few laps in, he's in the lead. But all indications were that he was not going to be able to do this. And that's the exciting thing when you can see the storylines, the story arcs, the subplots to what's going to happen in the race unfolding, especially when the cars lined up on the grid and there were only two cars that were not running the median tires. And that was the two Red Bulls were on hards. And you thought to yourself, I wonder how this is going to unfold. One thing we do have to mention, of course, it was that Lando Norris was flying as well all weekend. And he, and the story for the McLaren was he had the one set of upgrades uh, as opposed to Oscar Piastri that gave them that really significant performance uh, on track. And you could see the way the car handled, the way he was able to push it. Uh, you, could, you knew in qualifying that we were in for a pretty sporty race. I personally think we're going to see him win a race before the end of the year. So you could see it all set out there. What made it even more special and relevant, I guess, to what we're doing here on Drive to Win in Las Vegas as we prepare for the November 11th race is, uh, November 18th race, is the fact it was run under the lights late at night. Brings in a whole new set of dynamics. And it isn't like driving in sports cars when you're at Sebring or Daytona. It, see, bring in the partial light. This is fully floodlit, but it, it super saturates everything for the drivers. It makes everything more vibrant. It makes it more incredible for us. We saw some great paint schemes, and they definitely change out some of the logos to, to be more reflective in the dark, but under those lights. But it really gave me an indication of this is what Las Vegas is going to look like. And of course, in two months, just about two months, we will be here. It's the Heineken Silver Grand Prix of Las Vegas. And here at The Win, we really are setting up everything to be where the party happens. We've got drivers staying here. We've got teams staying here. There are all sorts of pop-up Lewis Hamilton merchandise, all sorts of things happening here. McLaren have their new experience center right in the center of the casino. And we will be in full flow all week with Drive to Win here in the podcast studio trying to grab drivers in. Now, you know where to go. Go to winlasvegas.com slash experiences slash F1 and you can find out how to be here. There are packages for every level all the way up to if you fly in your big G5, we can take care of you. If you come in a minivan, we can take care of you. Anyway, there's so many ways to be here. And I'll tell you what, it's hotting up every single week as we progress towards November 18th. Well, let's talk about our guest. Phil Hill was an icon to everybody in American motorsports. He pretty much won everything. He was the 1961 Formula One for world champion for Ferrari. He was a three times Le Mans and three times Sebring 12 hour winner. And he was also part of the establishment that really changed automotive culture. He won the first ever Pebble Beach road race. He then went on to win with a contemporary car, the first ever Pebble Beach Concorde d'Elegance. And he was a familiar figure all the way through the evolution of that event. And Derek, soon followed in his footsteps. 
He had success in all sorts of single seaters. He actually won his class at Daytona 24 hours and at the Sea Ring 12 hours, just like his dad did. But then the movies came asking and Derek got pretty involved in a lot of the uh, stunt driving for different movies, doing commercials. That's kind of what we do as a driver when we can apply our talents to other things. But the big thing, and we'll grab a, a word from him about this later, is he's just been heavily involved in Italy in the shooting of this epic new Ferrari movie all about Enzo Ferrari. Uh, Patrick Dempsey's involved, so many other top actors. And Derek not just drove, but also played the role of one of his father's own real life contemporaries. Very excited to have Derek on the show. Derek, mate, thank you for taking the time and representing the family and welcome to Drive to Win. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Justin. Yeah, as I said, as you were just saying before we came on, uh, last time we saw each other was in the beauty of, of Ojai in a very village-like atmosphere. And here we are talking about Formula One, just the joy of our lives. Yeah, very random, isn't it? I very, love it. very random. Well, let's kick it off. I, I thought I, normally in my open, I, I go through what happened in the race, but I, I thought it would be much more fun to sort of work our way through the Singapore Grand Prix together with some of the highlights. Um, first of all, what did you enjoy the race? Did it was it what you were expecting and waiting for? Well, yeah, actually, I, I decided to tune in uh, for real this time, knowing that Red Bull were having their problems. I think. You know, I collectively share that with so many people out there who've been following this season because, great, I mean, Max won 10 races in a row. Bravo to him and to Red Bull, but it doesn't make for very exciting racing. Other than, you know, who's racing for second place. But we want to see so many of these teams that have been doing so well, making so many upgrades and improvements, actually fight for the top of the podium, which is what we got. Yeah, and I think that that's the way it unfolded for me was well the, the precursor to it was the minute i knew that qualifying had pa panned out the way it had red bull so far back i'm thinking this could really work i don't think max is going to dominate his way to the front the pace he's been showing but how did you feel after the start i'll share my thoughts it started so much excitement so much build up and then basically we turned into a procession and we we just saw them running to tire management, tire strategy, saving everything right from the get-go. That confuses us, and we know what's happening. What's your thoughts on that? Should Formula One do that? Well, I mean, first of all, let me put the whole race in context for me. I have a four- and a six-year-old watching it with me. I am rapid-fire asking, uh, answering just these really hilarious, nonsensical questions the whole time while I'm trying to focus on the race, but it's the beauty of seeing it through children's eyes. Uh, yes, Singapore is so much like Monaco in that it just is a procession of a race. You know, so much of the onus is on qualifying. And so you almost have to expect that the cars are going to go into this sort of train and there's not going to be a lot of uh, passing. Just like, you know, DRS can only do so much at a circuit like this. But um that's what I was expecting. You know, it was uh, exciting nonetheless to see uh, cars, you know, everyone racing for the lead other than Red Bull. Yeah, exactly. We've been saying, haven't we, all, all year, it's like if they weren't there, can you imagine what the racing would be like? And here was our first time to actually see that unfold. I did think it was interesting as they were doing that to see the difference just visually in a Formula One car from being on the edge to being just underneath it. And at no point are they resting on, on their laurels. At no point are they running softly. But you know, you know that feeling when you're not running at full pace, how suddenly it's actually harder to keep your, your attention. Did you, did you sort of, uh, could you put yourself in their shoes when you could see just by the way their, their hands were working on the steering wheel, the, the dynamics of the car, you could definitely tell they were running to their order. Correct. Yeah. And I, I guess you would attribute that to to tire management and, and keeping them, you know, on, on their strategy. It, it's it's hard for me to tell. You know, I don't like watching Formula One is like a strategic chess game so much mm. with all the tire management. I prefer just to see them all going. Fl I mean, that's the nature of Formula One. They should be pushing flat out from beginning to end. Um, 
I don't know. What were your thoughts? Did you feel that? I, 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 I'm looking at the race thinking they're always pushing to the maximum, but there is this incredible element of tire degradation and, and to see those final laps made up for the whole rest of the race. Yeah. I mean, that was my thing there. I was, I was going, God, I mean, I watched, there was a, 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 a sequence of in onboards from Max's hands and <laughs> They never look like they're driving that fast with the hands anyway, do they? The way the steering feedback is, they always look so smooth. Um, but I was watching his hands and he was just unwinding them gently and going up against the wall. And I'm thinking, that boy ain't pushing yet, but he was still overtaking people. I think where we saw it most was with Carlos Sainz and it really set the procession backwards. George Russell said, you know, I want to win this race. And you can imagine the the intense radio communication between them and the strategists, and, and even the Ali Jack and David Coulthard, who were, were commentating on F1 app, were saying, what will be the catalyst for it just to, to change into the next phase of the race? Rather like, you know, when you watch those cycling races on the velodrome or whatever it is, you know, when they go around and they go slow, they go slow, and then they all, all hell breaks loose. I was waiting for sure. that moment. That's what I was waiting for. And, yeah. and, and it came, didn't it? When Logan Sargent hit the wall, or the, it was like almost like a little bit of a premature start. He hits the wall. Red Bull strategy went upside down in a moment. He got over, Red Max got overtaken by five cars on the first few laps after that on fresh tires for them because he stayed out. And suddenly you could see this race taking place almost like the phase two. And, and there was definitely a shift in the energy. Sure. Yeah. I mean, getting to those first pit stops, uh, getting off uh, the hard tires and whatnot, or, or whatever their second set was going to be. And then to see Ferrari uh, mess up their double stack. I mean, it really sort of screwed uh, Charles Leclerc there. Uh, I think sending him back to sixth place. Yeah. But Carlos just was uh, a master uh, this weekend and controlled the race, put it on pole. It was so great to see. I mean, you know, regardless of... Um, well, that's just it. Modern day Formula One, the drivers have to be so smooth on the wheel. I mean, the better the car is set up, the smoother their hands are going to look on the wheel. They're not going to look like they're fighting it with big oversteer or anything like that. And um, I think that's just the nature of it, especially at a place like Singapore, where it's millimeters, centimeters, as we saw with George Russell at the end. You cannot afford to get all crossed up and to even touch the wall uh, without risking being out of the race. Yep. Yep. So true. Now your Ferrari, your family's relationship with Ferrari is decades, decades old. And I know, well, I'm sure you have a, a great affection for what they do on track. Are you like the rest of us waiting for them to sort of mess it up based a little bit on strategy or, or the wrong call or instructing the drivers to do the wrong thing or do, making a mistake in the pits? Because they have tended to do that. Obviously, the last couple of races have been pretty flawless. I was waiting for them to display their Achilles heel by, you know, pushing the tires too much. But it was really impressive when Carlos held his pace, but bewildering that George Russell behind didn't sort of push him anymore. I would... At that point, I was kind of questioning what was going on. Do you think George should have pushed a little more in the middle of the race? Do you think that would have force Ferrari into an error? I mean, potentially, but I, I'm feeling like Carlos is developing into a driver where he's very, you know, he's very focused. It's hard to push him into an error. He's just at that stage. I mean, I think a team can only stand so much internal suffering yeah. <laughs> as yeah. Ferrari has that, uh, you know, that's just only going to focus them more and more. Fred Vasseur, uh, the team principal, Finally got the monkey off his back, their first win. And uh, it was just uh, remarkable. But, you know, you see that in Formula One. We go through these horrendous phases of making so many mistakes. And you just wonder, when is it ever going to, you know, click for them? Yeah. And, I, and I think we just saw that it did. And George, as hungry as he was, was probably waiting for that last set of tires. They were saving a fresh set of mediums to make his big push. And, uh, you know, you... You can't afford to push too hard in the middle of the race. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're going to, well, you know, potentially mess it up at the end of the race. Yeah. So that was probably Mercedes strategy. And, and yeah, it would have been nice to see him push him a little harder, but I think it all played into their strategy. Yeah. 
And when they came in, it was it was brilliant when both Mercedes came in under that virtual safety car when Ocon stopped out on the track. And I just saw that it was like a, it was like Drive to Survive. It was like the perfect script unfolding because when Mercedes came in and put on those new tires and I was, I've always tell my kids, it's the same with you, you know, you're talking to yours. I'm like, at this point, some very smart people are on analyzing all their data and back chiming it from the end of the race. And it was, the announcers said it, didn't they? They can catch, George Russell and Lewis can catch for the win by the last couple of laps, which of course sets us up as fans just with this nail biting finish. And it was really compelling viewing, watching them make their way up. It was. I mean, we rarely get such a good finish in Formula One. And, you know, when it, we had eight, nine laps to go and there was only like a maybe a 10 second gap somewhere in that area yeah. between the Mercedes catching uh, Lando and catching Carlos. It was just you knew it was just going to be a nail biter right to the end and seeing, uh, you know, well, I just caught that clip, you know, watching the sparks fly when George hit the wall yeah. and went straight on. And you were just, everyone was uh, together in disbelief at that moment. But, you know, when you went back and you watched it and you saw that Lando also touched yeah. the wall. But with the front tire, you know, right? I've, yeah. With the front tire. But, you know, I, I think what nobody was really talking about, which was what I felt George might have experienced, was you're tucked right up under the, the rear wing and you're right on the gearbox of the person in front of you. And you're judging where you are on the track so much based on where the person in front of you is. It'd be like doing lap after lap at Monaco or on any street circuit, really, where you can't be totally focused on where the wall is. You're just playing off the person in front of you. And so I think that actually really messed up George to have Lando that far over. And when yeah. we say that far over, we're only talking a matter of inches. Yeah. And it was just enough, I think, to throw him off. And he just clipped it that much harder and sent him straight on where Lando, how lucky did he get to be able to finish the race? Yes. He said afterwards, it just, <laughs> it just altered the steering a little bit, you know, off center, but you know, that moment, right. I remember, uh, side note, I, we were at Detroit Grand Prix. I was in the Trans Am and I could see the jutting of the apex coming onto the back straight. I could see the, the wall kicking out a bit. And I don't know if you've ever done this, Derek, it's almost like you, you go, I don't want to hit that. Why am I driving straight? I mean, why am I even going so close to it? And I clipped it and yeah, sure enough, damaged the, the, you know, the, the front rack, but they are dealing sure. with such small tolerances. I mean, I love that thing on the broadcast where they show, you know, one centimeter away from the wall, five centimeters. I mean, that is extraordinary accuracy while the tires are de degrading as well, isn't it? It is, really. It's remarkable. And as fast as these cars are going, I know these drivers get so much time in these cars to slow everything down. But, um, you know, you wouldn't maybe call it complacency, but I think you just get in the zone. And when the person in front of you is thrown off a little bit, you won't even realize how much that's going to throw you off. And, uh, yeah, it was unfortunate for, for George. But, you know, that play between... Uh, Science and Norris in the front, you know, I think uh, Carlos called it the Carlando moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was really beautiful. You know, I mean, for for Carlos to to show that he could be willing to, to, to do that dance where he's going to slow it down just enough to let uh, Norris stay in the DRS zone, knowing he's possibly risking Norris attacking him into the next corner, was uh, really showed how well, and, and, and I think what what maybe a future champion this driver might be. I'm so glad you brought that up because it was when they started mentioning it on TV, it was like, God, is he really doing that? If he does that at the wrong moment, like he said on a, a his post-race interview, if I, I knew if I made one lockup, one, you know, one mistake, I was inviting him into my, you know, into my inner, you know, personal space. So I was, you know, I knew he could go by, but if he, it was also his awareness, which I think we've seen from Sainz over the last few races. He is maturing as the team leader. He is also very adamant about his own imprint on the strategy from in-car, which I think, you know, every driver who rises maybe world champion material has to be able to do that. And the fact that I think he did that all on his own without, you know, approval from the team was quite staggering. 
But he also knew that if he hadn't have done it, Derek, he was going to get overtaken. I mean, if Russell and Lewis had gone by Lando, he knew he wouldn't win the race. Absolutely. Yeah, I know. He really was just threading the needle lap after lap after lap. And it was beautiful to see. I don't think people really can understand what a tightrope, you know, a driver's mm-hmm. walking on uh, under such pressure to pull off the win like like Carlos did. But that's what made it so exciting for us because really any of those top four uh, from Carlos back to Hamilton could have won that race. And I think Lewis was just hanging out waiting for all hell to break loose. Yeah. I mean, he could have he could have won it if uh, Carlos made a mistake. Yeah, I actually think he was the the fastest for the first time, faster than George when he got into the latter half of the race. He looked very predatory, didn't he? He he was waiting, but he knew he couldn't, you know, screw his teammate up. But I think he was urging George on a bit. Like, George needs to, he did say, didn't he? George needs to pick up the pace a bit because, you know, yeah. to close that gap to Lando. And I wonder, you always wonder, type of overtaking maneuvers you need to do to pull off a pass on a track like Singapore. It was some of the moves that Max made. You know, there was that little right left seg- segment when La- uh, Max would just, you know, come off the brakes and like really release the car into the left apex and and basically force himself past the, the guy in front. No one else really did that move. And that was the only move I think that, Lan- you know, um, George had on Lando and it's something he hadn't done all race in that place. So I think it, I think he just didn't have the options, but boy, I was, right, I, literally, I was, I was so excited. Um, but we've all sat in, yeah. we've all sat in fourth place. Haven't we going, I could win this. This could all go wrong for everybody. I could win this. Right. Yeah. Well, with the tire management, I mean, it really adds so much more of an element that, you know, you, I kind of go back and wish, you know, you, you, you could have those advantages at some point in your race over another driver with, mm. with you know, it's with such a magnitude of an advantage. It, it's almost shocking how much of an advantage they can get with fresh tires. Uh, but, you know, that that's racing. I think, you know, this sets up the season really well for the next third of the year. I, I can't wait to see the Japanese Grand Prix because we're going to see if these technical uh, directives have really affected Red Bull uh, as much as, you know, we might think they might have. I, it, Christian Horner was downplaying that it was it was these TDs that, that affected the, the the performance this weekend. And in fact, it was almost funny to watch how much yeah. he was trying to downplay it because everyone knows there was a lot to, to this that, that might have slowed down these cars, as, as it has done with Aston Martin. I mean... Uh, look at Fernando Fernando Alonso. I mean, he was way down. And um, I think when it comes to throwing, you know, a new regulation that really upsets the balance of a car that the team has gotten really comfortable with and that their drivers are so dialed in with, it can really turn the whole strategy upside down on where they're going with the setup of the team. Yeah, I think you're right. Japan will be it's fast. It's very, you know, it's, it's, it's very much a high downforce track. I think we're going to see, we're going to, the stories for me, Derek, are, can science carry on his momentum? You know, he's got that winning taste, hasn't he? The like blood in his mouth of how you, you know, what it's like to be a killer and he's ready to, to go. Lando, I think he's going to be right up there again. Oscar Piastri, he's also a, a future champion. Uh, I hope that, their confidence is what offsets Red Bull's maybe instinctive or more natural advantage going into Japan. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And I, I heard something that Max said. You know, he finished 20 seconds behind the leader in, in fifth place, which uh, there is another very impressive driver. I mean, Max Verstappen, you know, could be increasingly becoming a bigger and bigger. I mean, what's the worst thing I could say about somebody? But he's not. He he. All this success, I feel, is he's so centered with it. He's so calm about it. You'd think after this ten-win streak uh, that he would, you know, have been upset or thrown off um, or had some gripes about it, you know, as he does. But I think he really took it in stride. And his he's saying how he wants to go in Japan, finishing twenty seconds ahead of second place. And so I love that he's got that drive, that hunger. <laughs> but he's just so confident, you know. Hopefully we'll see him pull that off. Yeah, fearsome, fearsome. Now, you you have such a, a bond as a family with Ferrari. I know it has evolved over the years into a 
you know, an unrecognizable company from, from when your, your father was there, where my dad was there. But the spirit of Ferrari exists in a very tangible way today in the same way as it did back then. The Tifosi, the people that work there, I think any driver that ever puts on that red race suit must just feel, regardless of whatever team they've raced for, that they've achieved something in their career that, that was why they started racing in the first place. But I also feel that as a brand coming off the back of their Le Mans win, it was, you know, which just really raised this, the whole energy of the, of the Ferrari, you know, race teams. And it really lifted them up. And then you see them doing this with Carlos Sainz now in the last few races. What do you think it means for Ferrari to, to have, to Ferrari as a, a family, what it means for them to have this level of success and watching Carlos Sainz up on, on the podium? Well, yeah, I think Ferrari could not exist not having some success in Formula One from time to time. I mean, that's almost their whole ethos is is uh, winning and winning in Formula One, winning at the top. And uh, and the pressure, I mean, you just kind of feel for those guys who've thrown themselves into the ring, you know, working at Ferrari, um, whether you're a driver, a team boss, I'm sure it goes through every rank uh, and file over there. You have to perform, and they can only uh, they can only uh, exist so long with with making mistakes before either you're out or they'll question their whole reason for being in Formula One altogether. So to see them win again, I think it's a great boost. Uh, they have to do it, and uh, Carlos got it done. Um, I hope that we're not going to end this without mentioning. The Ferrari film that's going to come out. Because it was about, that's nice my segue. connection to Ferrari now. Nice segue. Thank you. Tell us about it. Well, yeah, no, it's been exciting to, you know, w w we were racing drivers, uh, pushing full full steam ahead in our, in our lives at one point. And we've gone on to experience racing in other ways and to enjoy it in other ways. For me, it's been enjoying it in, uh, in, in some filmmaking in the last uh, few years. Uh, going from Ford versus Ferrari now to working on the Michael Mann Ferrari film as a stunt driver and in the Ferrari film as an actor uh, playing Jean Barra, a French driver. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, it's it's exciting. It'll be coming out Christmas Day. Uh, I hope everyone will set aside some time uh, during the winter holiday to go to their theater and see it on the big screen. I think really to see a movie like this with all the racing action on the big screen will be well worth it. How I know you were there months what do you think your dad would have thought about you playing one of his competitors? Oh, I think he would have, he would have loved it. You know, he worked uh, towards the end of his career on the Grand Prix movie, which was filmed in 1966. And he retired in 1967 and he got to know John Frankenheimer really well, but you know, he had worked on movies, you know, being in Los Angeles, uh, he, he became somewhat of a go-to guy throughout his career working on, on any Hollywood films involving motor racing. But I think Grand Prix was kind of the, the culmination of it all, the pinnacle of it. And, and it ended in a lifelong uh, friendship with John Frankenheimer, who was such a magnificent director himself and loved racing, loved cars. And he, he'd be very proud. He'd love it. And especially that we're representing a, a period of time that he was so involved in, in the mid-1950s at Ferrari. Definitely, everybody, go and check the movie out because uh, I'm excited. And if you haven't watched Grand Prix, you want to see James Garner, you want to see cameos by Graham Hill. I, I love watching that movie because the, the women were so glamorous. The proximity to the racing was was so intimate. The photographers, everybody was was a time of, of Formula One, wasn't it? Well, world, world racing where it must have been like the rock and roll business where you could hang out with the band afterwards. You could, The photographers got so up close and personal with the stars. It really is an emotional insight and a very accurate insight into the era your dad lived in. Absolutely. And I, I hope Michael Mann is as experienced a director as he is. I think, uh, I think he really nailed it on this one. You know, it's, it's hard to look back 60 years and get it completely accurate. But being there in Italy, it, which, you know, those old towns in Italy are like a movie set themselves. You know, you, you don't need to do much to dress them up. And so uh, I think it's going to be kind of a, a travel back in time just to see this film. 
Well, before we let you go, it is time for the Mobile One Pit Stop for the Love of Driving. Are you ready, Derek? I'm going to ask you a few questions. Oh, never ready, but go for it. What would your father think that in today's era we have three Formula One races in America? Would he believe it? Never. <laughs> would you rather have raced in the era you did or your father's era? You are a humble, quiet man with a heavy right foot just like him. Which era would have been your choice? I think back then, absolutely. If you had that sort of a, you know, life reset button like you get in a video game. I mean, it was so much more game. Anyway, there's a lot to unpack with that that yeah. question. But yeah, I think back then would have just been the ultimate. What will you say if one of your kids turns around and says to you and your beautiful wife, I want to race? Oh, gulp. Yeah, <laughs> no, luckily... You know, luckily, I think um, my, my son will even have taller genes than I have. I don't think it, I'm expecting him to be well over six feet tall, um, given, you know, the height in the family. So I'm going to discourage him maybe a little bit. Genetics are going to discourage him. Good answer. Um, <laughs> if you could do your stuff all over again, movie star or racing driver? Racing driver. I mean... I think movie stars are jealous of racing drivers, aren't they? I think so. We're doing too. the real thing. We're doing the real <laughs> thing. And finally, tell me something that most of us don't know about your father. Oh, my father was um, somebody who was just so much more than just a racing driver. Uh, he was uh, incredibly talented in, in, in so many things. Um, and he, he was just a lover of life. I think that's why he survived. You know, he actually put survival as a priority in his, uh, in his career, uh, which might have seen him not always be right there on the ragged edge as Enzo Ferrari would have wanted. But he knew where his limit was and um, and he lived to tell the tale. Derek, that is beautifully said. Thank you for joining Drive to Win. So exciting having you on. Are you going to try and come out for the Vegas race? I would love to. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to try. I'm going to pull every string I have to get yeah. out there. I actually may have a gig for you. Yeah. Doing something. Oh. Remind me after this. Someone contacted me. Okay. Ah, I was looking for a stunt double. All right. All right, we'll do it. Thank you so much, mate. <laughs> See you soon. Yeah, thanks, Justin. Nice talking to you. Well, hey race fans. What is it about a race that's so exciting? The breakneck speeds, the constant pressure, the ever-present threat of danger, or is it simply the driving? Think about it. It's perfect. There's no phones, no laptops, no screens, just the world's greatest drivers, cars, and the ultimate freedom. Yep, it's all of the above. Mobile One for the love of driving. And of course, always a special empathy for anyone else that grew up in the very large shadow of a famous racing father. But Derek, like me, has found his own mark in life. So very exciting to talk with him. So Suzuka this weekend, the Japanese Grand Prix, it's one of the racetracks that every driver worth their salt is excited about going to. Uh, since 1987, it is fast, it's exciting, it's got incredibly high downforce, super fast corners, it's got these snaking S-curves, it even has one of those crossovers, rather like if you had a scale electric set. It's just one of those places, as a driver, you are able to take you and your car to the absolute limited performance which, of course, is going to suit some people rather than others. We saw moments in Singapore through the two fast last corners, which are a little more Suzuka-like, where the Red Bull was definitely faster than anyone else. Couldn't make up for the deficit across the other 17 corners. But it shows that when it comes to high-speed balance and ultimately taking the tires, tire management to the edge, it is probably the domain of Red Bull. But let's not forget the others. There's so many teams that... I don't think it's an anomaly that they were that fast. I don't think it's an anomaly that Lando Norris was so quick in the upgraded McLaren. We know he's going to be there. I said at the top, I think he's going to be in for a win this year. We know that Mercedes, George Russell, is going to come back with a vengeance. His little mistake at the end with severe consequences in the Singapore Grand Prix is something he won't want to repeat and he certainly wants to be there with his teammate Lewis Hamilton and vying for the top place on the podium. I just think there is so much to play for, and will Carlos Sainz be able to carry on that momentum? I mean, just 
incredible storylines that we're going to see. And don't forget, there were also a couple of standout drives during the Singapore race that really do set the scene as well, slightly lower down. Liam Norson, who out-qualified Max Verstappen, yes, I'm sure he didn't expect to hear that uh, in his resume, just in his third ever Formula One race, he also got and scored his first championship points. And anyone who follows Formula One knows that that has an economic impact for the team. That's when you un literally unlock Pandora's box of goodies and increase financial support from Formula One. So every championship point really does mean so much. And for him, it was, as he said, Singapore was the hardest race he's ever done. But heading into Suzuka, it's a place he knows. He's tested there twice. He's raced there once in super performance, which really must give him a much elevated chance of success this weekend, even, even more success. So uh, also, let's talk about Max. I do want to give him full credit. Sometimes the mark of a champion is the way they handle defeat. And you could just see his body language all the way through uh, every time he got out of the car, but especially after the race, you could see just his, his literally the, the demoralization that he had. But he regrouped. By the time he hit the media pen, he said, you know what? I knew that the roller coaster sort of would end, that what we've been achieving. Yes, I'm incredibly proud of the results I got. He said, but eight races in a row, 10 races or 12 races, it it really didn't matter. It still was outstanding, and he's rightfully proud of him and the team. But he said something that should s sort of inject fear across everybody else in on the grid. He said, I, I was 21 seconds behind at the end of that race. I'm going to win in Japan by 21 seconds, <laughs> which, as we know, he's more than capable of. So we're going to see so much coming this weekend, I think, like me, you're going to be looking forward to seeing who can keep the, the play going. I do think that all those top teams who did so well, Mercedes, McLaren, and Ferrari, they've got the, the bit between their teeth now, and Carlos Sainz has that X factor that every driver wants, which is when you've won a race, you know you can. And when you've won a race against those guys, the best in the world, his confidence will now be up here. So I'm looking forward to how that unfolds. Well, now let's talk the Las Vegas Concours, which is taking place on November 11th, exactly one week before the Heineken Silver Grand Prix. It's a fresh take on the Concours world and really does kick off with some incredible owners, some of the biggest collectors in the world, and their magnificent cars. You, as you will see, there are cars from every generation. Some of the names for these categories just reflect the vibrance of the way the win are approaching this event. American Classics, we've got the Rat Pack, American Disco, Bella Machina, Piccadilly Circus, and Dan Kishon. If you want to find out more, you definitely have to be here because the kind of cars you're going to see are things such as this 1964 DBS 5 Aston Martin. James Bond would be very excited to know it was here. And then at the other end of the scale, in the hypercar department, we have this 2020 Hermes edition Bugatti Veyron. Of course, many ways to get here. If the general admission ticket is only $100. So definitely bring your family and come and see. It's not just the cars. There's going to be some incredible celebrities and definitely a Formula One feeling. So visit lasvegasconcord.com and take a look at not just the schedule of events, but the many ways you can be here. You have general admission, you have the hosted bar, chairman VIP, and all sorts of room packages. Well, bring your family, make it a day out, and it's definitely a way to set the tone for the most exciting week of motorsport in the United States in 2023. A big thank you to Win Las Vegas for facilitating and sponsoring this show, as well as Mobile One for the love of driving. Enjoy the race this weekend. I'll see you next week.